show out of NASA's Ames Research Center, where we talk about all the nerdy NASA news you need to know about. So today I have with me my friend and office mate, <laughs> Tiffany. Hey. Hi, everyone. I am your co-host, Tiffany Blake. If you didn't know, we are live on Twitch, YouTube, Facebook, and Periscope. Uh, but if you want to participate in the chat and ask our guests some questions, there's only one place you can do that, and that is at www.twitch.tv slash NASA. Right, and we are excited today to be holding our second annual NASA-themed Halloween costume and cosplay contest. Yes, I'm excited. I'm excited. Uh, if you're a NASA fan looking for a last-minute Halloween outfit, you're in luck. Uh, we are going to show you a collection of NASA-inspired costumes and tell you how you can recreate them at home. Right, and if you do end up using any of our space-themed costumes for Halloween or some other NASA-inspired costume, we want to see it. So you can share those with us on social media using the hashtag NASA costume. Yeah. yeah. So before we start, Abby, how about we remind the people about our cool little clock? Oh, okay, <laughs> yes. So this is our moon countdown clock that you see right here. And that is because five years from now, in 2024, we are planning to send humans to the moon as part of our Artemis program. So this clock right here is counting down the days, hours, minutes, and seconds until the next man and the first woman will set foot on the South Pole of the moon. So to learn more about that, you can go to nasa.gov slash Artemis. So should we get right into it? Yes. Should we see some started. costumes? Yes. Okay. So our first category is everyday NASA looks. So the, the outfits you're going to see are things that our researchers and engineers wear day to day, doing their work, doing special tests. You'll see them around the center wearing these things. So let's bring out our first guest. Come on out, Mary Beth. Hey now. Oh yeah. Nice. <laughs> Come yeah. on up here. <laughs> Excellent. We'll give you a minute to get your tools set there. Get all tucked in. And you might have to take off your gas mask yeah. there. <laughs> your <Yeah>. dust mask. <laughs> Welcome. Right. So why don't you start by introducing yourself to the audience and right. tell us what Sounds you do good. here. So my name is um, uh, Dr. Mary Beth Wilhelm, and I'm a research scientist here at NASA, and I'm an astrobiologist, which means I study the origin of life, the evolution of it, and then I search for it elsewhere in our solar system. That's, That's so cool. cool. So tell us about what you're wearing. All right, so this look <laughs> um, is what I wear when I'm collecting samples mm -hmm. in a Mars analog environment oh. on Earth. So because Mars is so far away and it's so expensive to get there, we often go to places on Earth that are like Mars so we can study certain things about it mm -hmm. and um, take things back to our lab and study them. What kind of environments on Earth are actually like Mars? Like, What are you looking for there? Right. So. Um, uh, Right now, I'm studying this place called the Atacama Desert in Chile, mm -hmm. and it's one of the driest places in the world. It only rains in the region that I visit once per decade. <laughs> That's absurd. Wow. Yeah. It's crazy <laughs> dry. Like, I can count the number of plants that I saw on one hand during our field trip. That's so wow. strange. And because of that, yeah. it has some of the lowest levels of biomass on the entire planet. So there's very, very few living organisms there. Mm -hmm. And um, us humans are very dirty. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that's why I'm wearing the suit, because mm -hmm. when I'm taking samples, I don't want to contaminate the samples I'm working with. Right, right, with your own skin cells and whatever it might exactly. be falling off. Um, yeah. We have a photo, don't we? I think so, From yeah. <laughs> Mary Beth in the Atacama. All right, oh, tell yeah. us what we're seeing here. Right, so this is uh, me taking a sample. Um, from one of the driest places on the planet. And here I'm trying to study the extreme limits of life and then trying to understand um, whether any remnants of life get preserved in the fossil record. Oh, wow. Oh. So you're talking about life like bacteria and things like that? Yeah, exactly, microscopic yeah. life. Okay. Oh. So um, we're looking for the chemical evidence of life that gets preserved mm -hmm. in the rock record. And um, specifically, I'm studying a type of molecule called lipid, a lipid, mm -hmm. so fats, which we love to eat, obviously. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and the cool thing about lipids is that they're extremely well preserved in the fossil record. Hmm. So if you look back at the very oldest rocks on Earth mm -hmm. and you're looking for evidence of life, you can still find some of the lipid molecules from those organisms that lived in those environments. The first life on Earth. Yeah. You can find traces of it. You can. Still alive. That's, that's nuts. Still around, that's yeah. fascinating. And yeah. so, like, um, when we're thinking about... Um, um, what we want to look for on Mars, we want to try to target these types of molecules that can live for that can that can stick you know, around for long really time. long periods of time because Mars 
um, used to have really nice conditions for life, mm -hmm. but like three billion years ago. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> it used to have a, a thicker a atmosphere <laughs> and yeah. liquid water on the surface, and so we have to look for the remainder of what might have lived on Mars. Right, right. Yeah. If there were any little microbes. Yeah. Right, exactly. What <laughs> parts of them would survive yeah. that long? Yeah. That's what yeah. you're looking for? Yeah. yeah. How That's do you cool. use your tools here? Yeah, okay. So, like, um, I'm kind of a cool hybrid scientist. So I do a mix of geology and biochemistry. Oh, so nice. I have my handy rock hammer. <laughs> <laughs> so I can break open the rocks and then for the really for the really um, uh, tricky samples we have a this is a drill string so you can see like I have some of the Atacama still stuck on there. Yeah, the, I see the red dust on there. Yeah, I've wow. destroyed a few of these in ah. my career. <laughs> and then once we get the stuff um, out of the rock we'll put it in our sample jar. Out in oh. the desert, yeah, in you're the desert. scooping soil samples and you get it in the bottle there. And I actually have a few samples from our last field oh. trip. Oh, cool. she brought samples yeah. from yeah. the Atacama. These are some really cool samples that I collected wow. from an ancient salt flat. Wow. So this is a, probably about uh, a few million years old. Wow. And you can see some of that black stuff in there. Those are some of the remnants of the life that lived oh in gosh. the body of water that formed this. Wow. wow. Is this salt? Yeah, this it's is almost pure salt? salt. Yeah. Wow. Yep. So this took a couple of drills to get out. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> little thing, huh? Yeah. So what do you guys do with the samples when you bring them back to the lab? Right. Or yeah. Bring so them back we take back um, all the samples we're interested in, mm -hmm. and then I take them to my um, biochemistry lab okay. here at NASA, and um, we dissolve the rock and we pull out all of the oh, yeah. chemicals, and then we study them with uh, analytical instruments okay. that tell us um, a lot about the sample, like. What it, who it is, what it might have eaten, like those oh, sorts really? of things. Oh, really? That yeah. much information? So wow. we'll spend years studying a particular site, and wow. I did my whole PhD in the Atacama. Wow. <laughs> so I've worn these suits for a long time. Yeah, <laughs> you're very familiar with the subject. Heat doesn't bother um, you much, huh? Oh, gosh. <laughs> I think heat, you learn to love the heat, I guess. Yeah. 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 Like, a few years ago when we went, like, the ground temperatures were, like, well over 100 degrees. So, yeah. you know, it and was, you're sweating <laughs> inside the So I don't I don't think it's ever been uh, ever been seen before. Maybe mm -hmm. maybe a long time ago there may have been. Uh, I'd have to look back at the literature, yeah. but right now no. Like right Mars now. is one big giant desert. Okay. And actually, for comparison, the yeah. Atacama is a thousand times wetter than than Mars and it's, than the surface of Mars. Okay. So the wow. driest place on Earth. The driest is place a, on wow. Earth. A thousand times wetter than is Mars. a thousand times wetter. So it's like comparing oh, wow. the driest place on Earth to the Amazon. That's the delta. <laughs> so Mars <laughs> is extremely dry. Wow, wow. wow. Yeah. Yeah. But but it's the best place you can practice on Earth, right? It's a really good it's place really to good. practice. Okay. <laughs> Makes sense. Outstanding. Okay, let me get through some more. There's probably five in line for you here. <laughs> so <laughs> Speed Racer 216. What material is the suit made of and does it keep cool? So the suit does not keep cool at all, <laughs> and um, they're special clean suits. So like when you buy them, there's uh, very few microbes on it, and it keeps all of your uh, microbes on the inside. And uh -huh. humans actually will um, emit about a million particles per hour, and that's like Jeez. after showering. We're, really? Yeah, exactly. We're just shedding. We're just shedding. Stuff we're constantly. shedding bacteria and organic molecules all the time. Wow. So you can imagine if you're studying a sample that has maybe only a few hundred right. cells yeah. that a million cells is going to be like totally yeah, overwhelming how important and you, it right. is. you don't want to take that back to your lab and then analyze yourself like that right. would be yeah. Yeah. <laughs> a <laughs> nightmare <laughs> my own cells. that wasn't the point here right. <laughs> right. okay uh, let's see if you can give us a number for this Ballasparkle asks is there a percentage of how much less microscopic life there is in that desert compared to an average environment yeah so in an average environment like if you took like um, the same amount of seawater you'd probably find about a million bacteria and compare that to the driest place in the Atacama where you only find about a hundred. Wow. So it's oh, wow. like yeah. significant. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. ridiculous. Wow. <laughs> yeah. We uh, have a question here from Z-Track. Uh, how did you get a degree in this? How did you, what was your journey to become a scientist? Yeah, yeah. A scientist, a scientist so that you are. I've <laughs> loved geology since I was in first grade wow. <laughs> and I loved space too and um, I actually got an internship here when I was in high school and then um, I went to college and I studied geology and planetary science. Mm -hmm. And then I went on to get my PhD in earth and atmospheric sciences with a, a focus on biochemistry. Oh, wow. Yeah. 
But I think a lot about being a student is about being self-motivated and coming up with Mm -hmm. a set of questions that you're really interested in answering Mm -hmm. and then learning whatever you need to learn to pursue those questions, whether that's geology or physics or chemistry or biology or even English. And and gosh, I'll tell you, being at NASA, a lot of what I do is writing. Yes, (laughs) it's true, isn't it? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so there's no one right path. It's no, there's follow what you want to do and do whatever you need to do, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, let's take a couple quick ones. Andy Mann says working at NASA is awesome. It <laughs> certainly sounds it if you're Mary Beth. <laughs> <laughs> um, Ian is a D-bag, so she's wearing her work outfit, is his question. So to clarify, yes, indeed, you do work in this. Yeah, so this yeah. is what I wear when I'm um, doing field work in the Atacama. But actually, I did do some work once in this um, ancient DNA laboratory where people have to wear suits like this, probably even more restrictive with complete coveralls um, every day while they're doing extractions from really precious samples they don't want to contaminate. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, yes, this is Mary Beth's real work outfit. But (laughs) if you want this to be your Halloween costume, (laughs) can you help us figure out some ways we could recreate this look? Absolutely. I think it's going to take a good trip to the hardware store. <laughs> you got to get some drill bits. Yeah, <laughs> right. Some coveralls. Yeah, mo- a lot of what I buy is actually from the hardware store. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It makes sense. Yeah. It's yeah. all the same stuff you need. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Getting your hands dirty out there for sure, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, awesome. Thank yeah. you. Thanks, guys, yeah. for joining us, answering questions. We're going to bring you back later on for the voting segment. Oh, boy. Yeah. Okay. But thank you for bringing your samples and your tools. And we will see you in a bit. Yeah. All right. Thanks, guys. All right. <laughs> Super cool. Pretty impressive. Yes. Yes. And, but, you know, doable. I feel like yeah. I could put together that yeah. costume. Yeah. If I pinch. could be Mary Beth one day, you know, for one day, why not? Don't yeah. you want to be Mary Beth? Yeah, good Shiloh point. Store. Yeah. I always wanted to be Mary Beth. Maybe yeah. Halloween is my day. <laughs> awesome. All right. Yeah. Let's move on to our next contender. Up next, we have Chuck. Come on out, Chuck. Yes, yeah, hello. <laughs> Excellent. Hello. Hi. I see a lab coat. Oh, yeah. Some, some gloves. Dust and dirt, some gloves and yeah. goggles. Feel free to come right on up yeah. to the table over okay. here. Those, uh, those chairs are hard to tuck in. There we go. <laughs> All right. How's so, that? Go ahead. Uh, tell us your name and what you do here at Ames. Sure. Uh, my name is Chuck Hornellison. I'm a mechanical engineer, and I work in the ballistic ranges here at Ames Research Center. Sounds quite interesting. We'll hear more about that in a second. But first of all, tell us what you're wearing and what Um, that's all about. I'm wearing uh, basically the standard attire we wear when we're conducting experiments in the ballistic ranges. It's a a fun place to work, but it can be quite dirty, so we typically wear lab coats, Mm -hmm. protect our clothes. Mm -hmm. We uh, typically handle explosives and and various um, hazardous Mm -hmm. materials, so we have the safety accoutrement, you know. uh, Yes. Yes. Glasses, gloves, all life. these things. Yeah, you want to go home with the same number of fingers and eyebrows <laughs> that you come in with. So. That's the goal. So yep. this is, yeah, standard mm-hmm. ballistic range attire. It's okay. been approved by Ralph Lauren, I believe. So, yeah, <laughs> Designer lab coat. That's, that's right. Okay, so you're dirty and you work with explosives. What exactly <laughs> is going on okay. at this ballistic range? Well, the ballistic ranges. There's actually two facilities within the ballistic range complex that are currently active. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of them is called the Ames Vertical Gun Range, and what we do there is we use a large gun to shoot high-speed projectiles into targets to simulate what happens when an asteroid or a meteor impacts a planet or moon surface. We observe the formation of the crater, where the debris goes, etc. Oh, In fact, I've got awesome. a, a brief yeah. uh, video that demonstrates yes, this. Yes, let's see can, that video. Oh, there you go. There is oh. the, the blue chambers where we place our targets and adjust the environment according to whatever... Um, conditions we're trying to simulate. The orange section was our, our gun beam. Uh-huh. There's a nice impact. You see the wow. the the, cra- the debris curtain evolving and as materials being excavated and as soon as the smoke clears, voila, there you go. There's yeah. the crater. Yeah, I see it, I see yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Yep, yep. That's not oh, your like regular gun. <laughs> no, no, no. It's not not a typical gun. It's it's uh, what we use is what's called a two stage light gas gun. Mm-hmm. And the way it operates is you you use gunpowder to shoot a piston down a tube that's filled with hydrogen and as the piston uh, traverses the tube, it compresses the hydrogen to extreme pressure, Mm -hmm. uh, tens of thousands of pounds per square inch. And uh, we then use that high-pressure hydrogen as our propellant medium or what we use to uh, launch the bullet out of our gun barrel. And the reason we do that is you can get much higher velocities than you can with a standard gun. Mm -hmm. Um, Our guns in the range complex top out at about 8 kilometers per second, which is 
roughly 18,000 miles per hour, or think wow. of it this way, if you're traveling that speed, you could fly from San Francisco to New York in about 10 minutes. Oh, wow. Ah. So a little okay. fun fact for you, we are, in fact, the fastest gun in the West. <laughs> yes. Nice. Yes. yes. Yeah. Excellent claim to fame. <laughs> so that's that's the vertical gun range. Okay. And, and I know you have you have another one yes, that I want to hear yes, about. Yes, yes, yes. We, we have some hellos for you, if oh, I could okay. just jump into the chat here. As does X3. Hey, Chuck! <laughs> hello. All caps, big hello. Um, Speed Racer 216, are those mechanics gloves? I love those gloves! Yeah, yeah let's you know, see. We have, we have various types of gloves. I don't know if they want to, you know, depending on what we're trying to do. Uh, some of them have this, um, you know, Geico, Geico, gecko like texture. <laughs> yes, in addition to working in the ballistic ranges, I can save you 15% um. on your car insurance. <laughs> no, it's, um, we have text, you know, to improve manual dexterity depending on what, what you're doing. Okay, yeah. And, See, and what really sort textured. of chemicals you're working with because you want to protect your, your skin and whatnot yeah. from acetone. Of course. Cool. Sleepy <laughs> underscore Gary. So cool. Oh, totally thank you. Agree. Um, and I know we're going to hear more about the other facilities, so let's do that first, and sure, then we'll see sure. if you answer some of these questions. Okay, that, the vertical gun, that was uh, uh, range number one, yeah. think hypervelocity impact testing. The other facility is called the hypervelocity free flight facility. Mm, okay. uh, we use the same sort of gun technology, but rather than uh, looking at the impact, we shoot small-scale models of uh, planetary entry vehicles down a, a long flight corridor. Mm -hmm. uh, we take a, lo a lot of pictures of them as they fly to, to map out the trajectory. Mm -hmm. And from that information, we can infer the aerodynamic characteristics oh, wow. of these uh, planetary entry vehicles. And I have one right here. Yeah. This um, this is a picture of one of the uh, models that we've we've shot over the years. Now, it, it may look uh, like some sort of a drawer pull that you would buy at Home Depot, you know, for five <laughs> bucks. But I assure you, this is actually a, a precise uh, scale model of the Orion capsule. Oh, yes. Oh. And so uh, we do have a video of, of one of these tests, these aero ballistic tests. Yeah, let's yeah. see that. Let's have a look. There you go. There's videos. the test section. Notice all the windows. Uh, that's one of the reasons you get dirty. You have 64 windows to clean after every test. Uh -huh. And uh, we, we launch the uh, models. Here's, here's a video of a model in flight. And we take uh, 32 still images from which we can map out the trajectory. And one thing, ooh, Jeez, there wow. it goes in a blaze of glory. And I do mean blaze. You know, you can see it's yeah. burning there. Yeah, yeah. One, one thing that was kind of cool from that video, you probably mm -hmm. noticed, was the gas cap in front of the model was, was glowing. Mm -hmm. And even though we were simulating flight, you know, way up high in the atmosphere, where it's fairly uh, thin and not a lot of air molecules, uh, the fact that you're traveling, say, 25 times the speed of sound, you're still compressing and heating this gas to extreme yeah. temperatures, and that's what causes it to uh, glow like that, which is a nice visual indication of why you need to have a heat shield on your vehicle when you're entering a yeah. planet's yeah. atmosphere. That's a wise precaution. So, so that, that's, the, uh, that's the free flight range. Um, awesome. it's, it's geared towards aerodynamics. Um, We've been in business, or that facility, not me, but the <laughs> facility's been in business since the uh, mid-60s. Oh, wow. Um, nice. It started off uh, supporting Apollo, and virtually, with just a few ex uh, exceptions, every NASA probe that's entered a planet's atmosphere has had some sort of testing done in the ballistic range complex wow, here yeah. at Ames. Wow, that's great. We've also been involved with some uh, private industries, such as SpaceX, the Dragon capsule, and Blue Origin, mm -hmm. the New Shepard capsule. So. Basically, my team and I, we, we provide a testing service. We, we operate the facilities, yeah. we mm -hmm. conduct the tests for visiting researchers who pay for access, mm -hmm. and then we deliver the data, and then they go off, publish their papers, whatever. Yeah. So mm -hmm. in that sense, uh, we really are a, a gun for hire, you know? Uh, so oh. another fun fact. <laughs> I love it. I so never thought of it that all way. the facts That's today, right. okay? Hired gun, fastest gun in the West. I, I should have dressed like Clint Eastwood, but if I... You, you should know, have, actually. Yes. Yes. If I'd only thought. Okay, okay. Totally next, needed that Western next year. Next Keep year. that in mind. Okay. <laughs> you need that Western <laughs> intro for him, too. That's right, yeah. yeah. Some cowboy music. Yeah. 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 See you Good as a cowboy. Ugly, you know? Yeah. <laughs> All right, next year. I can't wait. Uh, I have some more questions for sure, you. Sure, sure. All right. Shoot. Uh, no pun intended. Shoot. <laughs> Says the fastest gun in the West. <laughs> um, how third asks again, do you use lasers? No, yes, do you use lasers? <laughs> uh, we do use lasers for various applications. Um, for example, in the vertical gun range, uh, we use lasers for our model detection system. That is to... Um, we have laser light sheets at, at specific distances, and when the particle passes through these beams, they stop uh, timers. So oh. knowing the, the time elapsed and the distance traveled, you can then calculate the velocity. So that, oh, well, that's how we measure the velocity of our, our okay. particles. So that's one application yeah, for lasers. Cool. Yeah. Nice. Huh. 
Um, I'll stick six E asks, is the gun test performed in a vacuum? Uh, yes. Um, both uh, for both facilities, actually, they're, they're vacuum chambers. So you can you can pump the pressure way down mm -hmm. and the vertical gun. You can simulate impact on an airless body uh, or you can backfill with different test gases. If let's say if you're simulating an impact on Mars, for example, you can put a low level of carbon dioxide in there. So we we can test it vacuum or in variable uh, gases for different atmospheres. All right. Sweet. All right. Uh, as X3 says or asks, what is the craziest experiment you've ever done? Ooh, craziest. <laughs> well, let's see. There, there's a couple that come to mind. <laughs> uh, one that was fun. This was a couple of decades ago. We were we had a researcher who was uh, simulating uh, the impact that that. Uh, we believe triggered the extinction of the dinosaurs. Oh. You know, 65 million oh. years ago, you cool. had this Mount Everest-sized um, asteroid that slammed into uh, just off the coast of the Yucatan and caused a big crater. And so that that was that was a very cool uh, project because what he demonstrated was if if the impactor had come straight in normal to the Earth, most of the ejected material would have gone straight back up out mm -hmm. into space. Oh, wow. But looking at the shape of the crater and the iridium deposits that came from the impactor and the way they're scattered across the earth, uh, it would indicate that it came in at a very shallow angle. And because of that, you had this wall of destruction of material going into the northern hemisphere and then a lot of stuff getting entrained in the atmosphere that caused dramatic climatic changes. So wow. what he was showing was that, you know, if we might we, we might not be here and dinosaurs might still be around if it had come in at a different angle, you know. So I that, see. So that, that, was, that cool. was a really, really yeah. cool example. That's a great example. Yeah. I know, right? <laughs> From spacecraft to dinosaurs. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Chuck does it all. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have to let you go really soon, but there are two more good questions, sure. so we'll do a rapid fire thing okay. here. And Nikki Cakes asks, can we shoot a spacecraft at another planet or towards another planet instead of using rockets? Ah. Well, from from the surface of Earth, that would be very difficult because you you know you've got gravity and you've got the atmosphere to get through, and so they've been trying to use um, uh, like guns to launch satellites into space, and it, it's really not a very uh, feasible uh, mm -hmm. means of doing so. Um, maybe if you built something you know that's in an orbital platform and launched it from there, that might be a good way to get it there. But uh, mm -hmm. from the surface of the planet, that now nah, that would be yeah. a tough sell. Yeah, yeah. too much atmosphere yeah. to get through. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You want to take the last one? Then? Ah, yes. So we have Scary Crazy Butter Knife here. <laughs> I love these names. Uh, <laughs> and says, Chuck, have you done any impact or microscopic impact testing on spacecraft? Yes, yes, we have. Um, the Cassini mission, Mars rovers, and whatnot. Mm -hmm. we, we looked at some vehicle survivability or vulnerability uh, tests where we, we took, uh, JPL came to us with certain components of the spacecraft they were concerned about to see if they had adequate shielding. So we replicated micrometeoroid impacts on those components mm -hmm. so you could so they could get a, a better probabilistic model of what sort of uh, uh, survivability the vehicle uh, or how likely would the vehicle survive uh, getting to its destination yeah. so we, we have done some micrometeoroid impact tests on spacecraft yeah that's so awesome you do so many different kinds of things in there it's, yeah it's a projects. lot of variety facility yeah. awesome yeah, it's very cool cool well thank you for coming sure, and sharing sure. it all with us uh, now you get out of here for now and okay. we're going to invite you back later right. when it's time to vote okay all right thanks <laughs> thank for you. coming on thanks, Chuck. Sure, my pleasure all right <laughs> did you know half of that stuff nope <laughs> <laughs> there. i that's knew like, that I knew they did the impacts, yeah. the crater formation. Yeah, but the dinosaur sort of research that's like so cool. Who would ever think? Right? I learned so much on this show. I obviously. know. <laughs> Me too. That's why I love it. So let's move on and learn some more from our next guest. Yes. Come on out, Lindley. <laughs> hey there. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> okay. Hey. 3D glasses. Yeah. Cool NASA shirt, yeah. I see. Welcome. Scoot right in there. Yeah. yeah. Get nice and close to the mic. <laughs> yeah. All right. So why don't you tell everybody your name and what you do here at Ames? So I'm Lindley St. George, and I am an intern here at Ames working with the Intelligent Robotics Group, creating uh, 3D visualizations using novel media, nice. particularly cool. of geological and geospatial data. Oh, wow. wow. Sounds really cool. All right. Yeah. Uh, well, we're going to hear more about that, I hope, mm -hmm. later. Yeah. <laughs> Describe for us your attire today. Yeah. Uh, so I'm dressed as a regular intern in my <laughs> normal everyday outfit. So we get a lot of uh, personal expression with how we dress. Um, <laughs> but
us a little bit about what you're working on. 3D printers, 3D glasses. Yeah. What are you working on? Uh, so I work on creating um, 3D visualizations, including uh, 3D printed models. Oh, okay. um, Maybe if you hold that still there, <laughs> yeah. Jesse could get a close up on a yeah. 3D printed model of what? Uh, so this is a borehole drilled by Curiosity, and uh, it was create this 3D model was created from stereoscopic images that it took of that borehole so, to get so the rover, different angles. Okay, the rover on Mars is drilling. It's into... drilling boreholes to see if it can get um, samples from, I believe they're called mudstones, oh, okay. to see what kind of chemicals and. Um, if there's any proteins or anything sort of like in the in those rocks um and so curiosity rovers in gale crater creating these boreholes mm -hmm. and taking stereoscopic images which are images from two angles and from that you can create um this is an incomplete 3d mesh so if you hold it at the right angle there's actually little holes in the bottom oh, yeah. and fixing those holes and seeing the best ways to take photos to get complete meshes is part oh, of what i do oh, oh, oh. Okay. um but mostly what I do is I take various stereoscopic images and use 3D printing and holograms and augmented reality to wow. see um, what types of visualizations we can make in the hopes that scientists who we can't just casually drop off on Mars mm. can make Earth-like observations. Oh, so yeah. observations like Mary Beth earlier was making in the desert yeah. using just these images that mm -hmm. we've collected uh, from Mars. Wow, okay, right. So scientists on Earth could be yeah. watching what... Can be watching correct, through yeah. the rover and making yeah. correct scientific observations. Oh, awesome, yeah, yeah. yeah. So Impressive. you're you're just getting started in your internship and you're, you're showing yeah. us some examples of the kinds of work that you're going to be yeah, so this, is, there, this right? is just a test print. Um, we're doing things like creating multi-material, multi-colored prints that mm. will have more realistic effects. Oh, cool. Mm. Um, and one of the things that we're most focused on is realistic optical effects uh, because it's very difficult in just a flat two-dimensional photo to uh, see sort of Originally. what kind of um, specularity or shininess, essentially, oh, okay. um, the rocks are exhibiting, which is a very important part of identifying it. A couple of images, yeah, of the kinds of data that I work with. So Ooh. I have here a 3D image of Mars taken by Curiosity. Yeah, so, so this you... is another stereoscopic oh, image. Oh, oh, which, oh if yes. I put on my 3D I glasses. See, yeah, if you yeah. put on your 3D glasses, you can see it in 3D if any of you at home casually have some of these lying around. <laughs> Who doesn't, though? Yeah. <laughs> From from your favorite 90s movies as a kid. <laughs> That's right. um, yeah, so this seeing? is Mount Sharp, uh, seen oh, through sweet. Curiosity's uh, oh, navigation camera, oh, wow. um, with just this 3D layer of rocks in front of it that you can see kind of coming out of the screen yeah. at you if you look at it right. You really are. Yeah. So it, awesome. it really shows you how different it is observing in 3D versus 2D. Right, right. All the yeah. difference that could make to yeah. scientists yeah. observing this way. Fantastic. Uh, and is there another one? Um, uh, there is another one. 3D yeah. image of Mars oh. taken from orbit, I see. Yes. So, so uh, we can bring that when up, this comes up, yep, this is uh, Mount Vallis, no a nice way. Welsh name, um, which is one of the oldest valleys on Mars. And this was taken from orbit, I believe, because they were scouting it as a possible landing site. Oh, cool. And it also shows that really intense uh, sort of jaggedness of the rocks yeah, when you look yeah. at it in 3D. Definitely tell the difference. Yep. And and these yeah, yeah. these images are available on NASA's website if any of you at home right. want to nip out and get yourself some of these for later. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to wear these for the rest of the show, I think. <laughs> They're a good just, look. They're high Abby. fashion. Think, yeah. yeah. And very cheap, so great for making your own costume at home. That's right. <laughs> you can easily recreate Lindley's costume at yes, home. Yes, yeah. Close your shoes, tie up your hair, and get yourself a pair of 3D glasses. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> How long have you been an intern here? Um, so I've been an intern here for eight and a half weeks, and I'm here for another seven and a half, so standard 16-week yeah. autumn internship. Yeah, but you guys get to work, and you do some we serious do. stuff yeah, when you're here. Yeah. They sort of, you get it described to you as you're just going to hit the ground running, and they just keep going, and then eventually you'll get to leave, but not before you get it done. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Uh, we have questions and comments yeah. for oh, you. Oh, yay. Yeah, we have uh, Biff, who is asking, what kind of CAD software do you use, if any? Um, so we actually work with a variety of things. So we don't do um, 
like geometric CAD style stuff because what we're working with is very organic forms. We're working with meshes, and mm -hmm. so you can use tools like um, Mesh Mixer. Uh, what I use actually varies depending on what I'm working, working with in on. that moment. So there's mm -hmm. certain programs that you need to make STLs for 3D printing. Um, we use a Prusa printer, <laughs> um, but there are different types. And I also use um, Mesh Mixer combined with Unity for some of my augmented reality stuff. So there's lots of different programs that you need to combine mm. to be able to do yeah, things. Cool. That's cool. Related, Stealthy Sumo asks, what kind of 3D printing stereolithography? Uh, yeah, so this is uh, fused deposition modeling. Um, it's not stereolithography, but you can use stereolithography to achieve a similar effect, um, but the texture would come off sort of um, almost inverted. Okay. Yep. I don't know this world, it's, it's, but I'm so, assuming um, <laughs> it's, the people it's asking questions Essentially, do. if you uh, carve chunks out of a surface so that when you hold it up to the light, you can look through it and you can see a 3D oh. image. Oh, yeah. ah, neat. So you're essentially making parts of it translucent to look through. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. A while ago, RJ the noob declared, that's awesome. I don't know it's, exactly it what, awesome. but yeah. it's awesome. The whole thing is awesome. <laughs> yes. Being a NASA intern, doing stuff to do with my research, it's all awesome. Yes. <laughs> a few more. Hey, Kitsaya, how do we get that awesome accent for our costume? <laughs> what, why don't you tell everybody where you're from and how um, you ended up here? Yeah, so I'm from New Zealand, and I ended up here on a partnership with um, the New Zealand government, the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment, in particular the New Zealand Space uh, Administration? Not Administration, Agency. Yeah. I, I got it confused with NASA. Uh, <laughs> civil, civil. <laughs> yes. Understandable. Yeah, NZSA yeah. versus yeah. NASA, they're very similar. Uh -huh. yeah. Um yeah, so uh, hang out in New Zealand for a while, really relax your vocal cords, no. lean into it. Um, it helps to be a bit Maori as well. Uh, take yeah. items. The, the really key thing, if you want to be an international intern, is really bring parts of home with you. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. yeah you're speaking to someone out there, Wordsworth says, nice yeah. to hear a New Zealand accent. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Hello, Wordsworth. <laughs> All right. We'll have to move on yeah. soon, but we have a couple more. Um, if you know this, Gay Eskimo asks, what clay types are the most common on Mars? Do you know? I don't know off the top of my head. Um, that is probably something that, that uh, yeah, more geologists would know. Mm -hmm. Part of what we're hoping to do in future with this is partnering with geologists to find out what is key to them with their work. Yeah. But one of the things that you face when you're designing for scientists is uh, kind of what's called like the you know it when you see it problem. Oh. It's very difficult to quantify what you're looking at mm. until you can actually show it to somebody and be like, is this what you wanted? And they can be like, kind That's of. <laughs> <laughs> and then you go back Almost. and you refine it and you, right. you keep updating your designs. Excellent. All right. Touching Zombies says she oozes to intelligence. <laughs> I would agree. And last question oozing. before yeah. we have to let you go. Mm -hmm. RJ the Noob asks, so how many different angled images of that drill site do you need to be able to make an accurate 3D model? Or I you believe just need one that this was just made from two. Um, oh. But there's a uh, method of creating images that involves taking entire images that are rotated around a single rock. Mm -hmm. And um, thinking of ways to get cameras like that to remote places is one of the big challenges that the Intelligent Robotics Group faces. Yeah, uh, I guess so. Just before I go, can I plug that, you know, um, if you too want to be an intern here, um, the website for that is intern.nasa.gov if you are a domestic intern, right, yeah. um, which is somebody from the US. And if you go there and you are an international student who's interested in becoming an intern, if you go to the uh, section on um, requirements, there's a link to the page for um, international interns, which has an incredibly long URL that I've oh. memorized. <laughs> Which is why you have to do it that way. That's fine. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. we know how to get there now. Yeah. Yeah. All right, excellent tip. Very good. Thank yeah. you for that. Yeah. Thanks for coming Thank on, you. sharing your work. <laughs> yes. Uh, I think we know how to recreate your look. We're going to tie yes. our hair back, yeah. close-toed shoes, yes. national nice tea. Buy bobby pins if you want to do this, because I forgot to bring some from New Zealand, and I had to borrow some from another intern. Uh -huh. So well, yeah, intern's yes. always Important. looking out for each other. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, well, we'll see you yes. in a little bit. We'll bring you yeah. back on for the voting. Yeah, yeah. Thank thanks you for much. joining thanks. us. All right. So, yes, intern.nasa.gov is where you want to be. Yep. And we did a whole episode about how to become an intern, and we met some interns yep. and some 
full-time employees who were once yeah. interns. So yeah. there's lots of info on that episode if you want to look that up. Interns are always fun. All right. Well, yeah. let's keep the party going. Let's, let's bring go. out our next two guests. Come on out, Nettie and Jenny. Oh, wow. What? Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> I have not seen these before. Fantastic. Is it hot? Come on up here. Hi. It's a little warm in there, but <laughs> pull up a chair. Thank you. Happy to join the party. Yes, here. happy to have you. Thank you. You got it? Ah, it's items. I, I, love the I love the matching. <laughs> yes. Thank you. <laughs> Word needed. Yes. You know? So, tell us your name and what you do here. Yes, my name is Nettie Roosboom. I am an aerospace engineer here. Oh. And I'm Jennifer Barney, and I'm also an aerospace engineer. And Nettie and I both work in the Unitary Plan Wind Tunnel here at Ames. The Wind Tunnel. Oh, tunnels. Yeah. All right, tell us first about what you're wearing, and then. So, Nettie and I up. both have on coveralls. Um, there's nothing really to the colors, just no. two really nice ones. Um, we also had two different kinds of respirators on, oh, but yeah. the important part is to protect our lungs and eyes from the paint that we're using. Okay. And we also are having some UV glasses because we also use UV lights. Gonna have to yeah, hear all about that. <laughs> yeah. Can I bring up your respirator yeah. here just to get a look? Wow, that's, that's... This is a full face respirator. That's serious. Uh, yeah. Okay. So this is to protect you while you are painting. painting. Yes. What are you painting, aerospace engineer? <laughs> this is not expected, right? No, it's not. Normally aerodynamic models, but specifically I think we have photos of, we are painting rockets. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. And tell us about... Yeah. scaled models we put them in these facilities where the air moves over them if we could we would launch these rockets or aircraft everything um, all the time yeah. but first we have to um, first we have to model them and we put them in a controlled environment like the wind, the wind tunnel, tunnel and we blow air over them and we measure the pressure distribution across the model that's at the heart of what we're wanting to do on most okay. wind tunnel tests okay right okay. before you, anybody builds it and tries to fly it you're going to yeah. test it yeah. all out on a little model. Yes, we need to understand it better. Wind yes, it yeah. goes yeah, over yeah. The, the model. Yes, right. under yeah. understanding how it acts under these controlled environments. Yeah. Yes. We have several wind tunnels here, right? And, and we have the biggest in the world, do we not? Yes, yes. we have Is that several, our claim to fame? Yeah. several wind tunnels, yeah. yeah. And we have the world's largest, but also the one that we work at. It was built in the 1950s mm -hmm. before even NASA was NASA. Oh, it was yeah, under yeah, the yeah. NACA. So it has a very rich history of yeah. uh, you know, the aircraft that our predecessor, the NACA, mm -hmm. was responsible for. And then all of the, the space missions that have had launch vehicles and, well, of course, crewed missions uh, have been tested here yeah oh, awesome yeah, yeah. what a historic place yeah. so cool okay so you guys are in there painting <laughs> tell, yes. tell us about the paint because yeah. that makes no sense to anybody at yeah. first <laughs> so we use a special kind of paint called pressure sensitive paint mm -hmm. it is a characteristic pink color because of the chemicals in the paint oh, really? but what makes it really special is when you expose it to uv light it emits or fluoresces its own light as well yeah 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 it goes we have a picture yeah. of yeah. this yeah. of one of the Rocket models painted. Yeah. Yeah, pink. yeah. Yeah, that's our hashtag NASA power of pink. <laughs> uh, yeah, so the, you know, as you can see in the photo, the, the model to our eyes is, is pink. Um, you see the, also the blue light that's coming around it, and that's what Jenny highlighted is that we have these UV lights uh, that look kind of blue or purplish. Mm -hmm. uh, that's me there in the test section. So the, as you can tell, this is a scaled model of a rocket. Mm -hmm. This is the rocket that is. Project Artemis. This is going to yeah. take the first woman and the next man to the moon. And on on yeah. that picture, yeah. you know, there's a place where the crew will sit. And mm -hmm. so, understanding how that model um, is designed and how it will be controlled when it uh, is launched is very important. So that's why we do extensive studies, extensive tests, and yeah. and now with the pressure sensitive paint, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're sensing that pressure over the whole vehicle, which mm -hmm. is. That's that's the new state of the art on um, what we're applying to wind tunnel testing. Oh yeah, awesome. how long does it take you to paint the model? <laughs> Usually a couple hours. Um, we use these spray guns that Nettie has modeled over here, and we apply a primer, a mm. base coat that's white, and then a red top coat that's very light, which is why it gets that nice pink color. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. I have some comments here. Verified Amy. I'm in awe of all of you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, 
relevant, RJ the noob, have you tested any models for the future Artemis missions? Yes. <laughs> You're just saying that. Yes. <laughs> and I would say, yeah, that's what we're doing right now is testing both uh, for the crewed Artemis missions, but also the cargo. So the, uh, uh, maybe a few images that you'll see on the internet. There are very different vehicles that you mm -hmm. use to move people because uh, that has a much higher level of safety right, uh, that, of you know, to keep people safe. safe. But yep. then we also move uh, you know, satellites. We move. We're going to move rovers. We're going to move habitats. We're going to uh, move Lots these lunar cargo. landers. Yeah, yeah, a lot yeah. of cargo. So there's different uh, rocket uh, nose fairing shapes that we test, and and we actually did one very recently. Yes, really? yes, and yeah. so yeah. that that's the rocket you're talking about, yes. right? Which is yes. called. Yes, this is this one is uh, SM one uh, oh. space mission one, but this is yeah also part of Artemis. Right, yes. and the rocket is the space launch system, yes. Yes. right? And yes. we have time lapse of you guys painting yeah. it. Yeah. yeah, let's see that, and you can tell us Super what to, we're, what to we're show seeing. this. Yeah, so as you can see, that's our respirators on there, um, and we're moving around the tunnel. Uh, the, there's, you know, small cylindrical sections that you see there at the left is are the boosters that, uh, yeah. you know, when this is, uh, you see animations, you see two boosters in this mm -hmm. core, and this is going to lift off up into space. So uh, we take those off just for painting, and then we'll put them back on. But, yeah, a lot of work goes into that, uh, you know, getting a wind tunnel model even just to that point. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's Before a really... You test it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, and it's beautiful because it gives you a really big appreciation for, you know, when that model is on the launch pad, just knowing yeah. how many people had a fingerprint on that model and who all was involved in all the facilities of NASA and you know what what rich uh, you know, facilities technology and people that we have mm -hmm. yeah awesome yeah. Uh, we have some more questions some to review and clarify Wordsworth asks what makes it pink, the pink? Uh, there's different colors so we have the Special about the paint to keep dust and condensation from accumulating on it while in space. So let's clarify. Oh. Do you use the paint only for testing here? Yes. Okay. It's very particular. It's just to help us see how pressures are distributed on the model. The actual rocket will be painted with real paint. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Not this special okay. paint. Yeah. 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 This is yeah. like high tech. It's a tool, right? It's, yeah. a, it's yeah. a pressure yeah. sensor, basically. Yeah. It is a pressure sensor, and yeah. yeah so traditionally, we've had these uh, pressure sensors that are on know, the model. On the model, yeah. and yeah, you know, they're they're fairly fine, but <laughs> uh, in respect to the area of the model, they're really coarse, and they're only in these discrete locations, so we know the pressure really well there. Oh, yeah. But like I said, at the heart of a wind tunnel test, you want to know the pressure di distribution oh, everywhere on the model. the model. So yeah. that's what the the paint is offering, and that's really where the state of the art is moving. It's like, how do we know the pressure across the whole vehicle? Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And in between those sensors, right? Yeah. Where you can't tell. Yeah. The paint yeah. is what helps you figure out what's in between. Yeah, because right? the sensors are so expensive, and you can't put them everywhere. There's not mm -hmm. enough room in certain models, so you'll use this paint to kind of fill in those gaps. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Sinful 7 CG. <laughs> These <laughs> painted models that you're testing for the mission, are they simulated in areas other than the wind tunnels? Painted models? No, I would say it's mostly uh, wind tunnel <laughs> technology. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. you know, it certainly could work here on the bench top, but uh, yeah, it's. I would say the main application is in a wind tunnel, and um, of course we, uh, we apply as much hardware as we can so we have multiple high-speed cameras we will we mount four we will start mounting eight high-speed cameras around the oh, wind tunnel wow. so that's that's what we're capturing so the the paint uh, responds mm -hmm. to pressure so it's either brighter or dimmer depending on the oxygen uh, which is the pressure and and we record from that with yes from the wind tunnel when it's on uh, the pressure um, over the vehicle and its magnitude is changing as we change conditions and so we take uh, lots of images and and then we take those images and do a lot of images processing to say this is uh, you know these main data products that you want to know uh, from the from the wind tunnel test right mm -hmm. right all yeah. the data that the designers yes need yes, to yeah. know do we need to adjust this or is this good and yeah that's kind of stuff. Yes. yeah awesome yeah what a cool job yeah all right come join us <laughs> <Yeah. Hiding> <laughs> So how can we become aerospace engineers for Halloween <laughs> doing pressure-sensitive paint testing? How can we recreate your look? 
Uh, so much like everyone else, we're pretty industrial. You probably want to go to a hardware store, get some coveralls, or a paint store, get something that looks like a respirator, something right. to protect mm-hmm. your eyes. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Don't yeah. forget the respirator. Yeah. You know, yeah. you could channel your inner Rosie the Riveter. Yes. 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 Halloween and just know that you're here with us, painting wind tunnel models, making yes. a difference. Yes. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, you guys can head backstage and then we're going to bring you all back all out right. in a minute because it's time to vote. Awesome. All right. Thank you. Thanks for coming Thanks. on. Thanks for joining us. Thank awesome. <laughs> They're the coolest. Yeah, right. All these jobs that I didn't even know knew I didn't know before exist right. at NASA. Right. And really these exactly things. what they do for missions, right? Yeah. So totally yeah. cool. You know, if you're painting a model I know. and you know, Who figuring would... out how you can like help to re engineer if needed. Yep. Yep. The big the biggest rocket we'll have. <laughs> right, exactly. That's what their work yeah. leads into. Yeah, it's awesome. But now, you guys, it is time to vote. Yes. So we're voting here for our favorite costume in the everyday NASA looks category. So we're going to bring back all of our guests and then you can vote in the chat for your favorite look. Mechanical engineer Chuck. Hey, oh. <laughs> Excellent. That's right. Next, we have NASA intern Lindley. Come on out. Pretty glasses. Pretty printed forehole. <laughs> and lastly, here's another look at aerospace engineers Nettie and Jenny. Nice. Look at that. Ugh. Look. Very nice. All right, take yeah. your looks. Yeah, get your votes in. Get your last looks in. Your votes are coming in. They're coming <laughs> in. I don't. I don't want to rush it. I don't want to call this too soon or yeah. anything. <laughs> get your last your poses. Pose. In. <laughs> you gotta show. This is your last chance. <laughs> <This is amazing. laughs> oh, true. What do we get if we win? Mary Beth asks. Our no. undying respect, respect and, and fan and love. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Ready, guys? I have the winner. It goes to Nettie and Jenny! (laughs) Our aerospace engineers spray painting rocket models with pressure sensitive paint. Yes, in their (laughs) unitary wind tunnels. (laughs) <laughs> That's right. All right. But you're all fabulous. Thank yes, you for joining us today. Of course. Yes. Thanks we, for joining us today. We loved hearing about your work. Thanks yeah. again. And happy Halloween. Happy yeah. Happy Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> fabulous. A quick reminder, you guys, that if you do end up using any of these looks uh, for Halloween, we want to see them. So you can share your NASA-inspired costumes with us on social media using the hashtag NASA Costumes. Yes, exactly. Yeah. I'm going to use that now that I have all of these costume ideas. Me too. I didn't have a costume as of this morning. But I didn't either. I I did. <laughs> <laughs> so that was fabulous. I'm yes. so excited about the everyday looks. But now we're going on to our second category, mm-hmm. which is NASA-inspired cosplay costumes. My favorite. Do you love yes. this? This yes. is so, I love how creative they get. Things you would never imagine come out of these NASA-themed costumes. Yeah. All right. So cosplay costumes with a NASA twist. Let's bring out our first guest. You want to introduce yes. her? Yes. So, if you've watched past episodes of the show, you may recognize the Sith Lord from a galaxy not so far, far away. And I hear that if you truly are one with the Force, she may even let you peer through a telescope. Come on out, Darth Kimberly, cosplaying as astrophysicist. <laughs> An astrophysicist, yeah. you say. Oh, no. Come on out, Dark Kimberly. Dark. <laughs> so fabulous. I love it. I love it. <laughs> Look at that yeah. lightsaber. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> it's better than I ever imagined. Very nice. <laughs> She's got her constellations. Oh, oh, oh there's oh. the telescope. Because she's <laughs> not just a Sith Lord. No, she's, she's an, an astrophysicist. astrophysicist. Yeah. <laughs> Come on up, Kimberly. Grab a seat, Kimberly. <laughs> Once you uh, decloak there, I think people might recognize yeah. you. <laughs> oh. You've 
you've been with us before, <laughs> but why don't you reintroduce Welcome yourself? Back. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> Tell everybody who you are and what you do here, Dames. I'm Kimberly Enico Smith. I'm a research astrophysicist. <laughs> In my cosplay as a research astrophysicist <laughs> uh, awesome. here at NASA Ames Research Center in Silicon Valley, California. Yeah. Awesome. Um, tell us a bit about what you're wearing today. <laughs> um, as a my costume, I have a the robe of a Sith Lord yes. in the Star Wars universe mm -hmm. with my, my hood and all. Yes. Um, but I'm also wearing um, a dress of the constellations. Yes. Ah. And nice. my props being my uh, Jedi night, uh, light cyber mm -hmm. for where I uh, harness the dark energies and a telescope mm -hmm. where I can peer into the universe. Excellent. Yeah. And I know that you put some thought into this costume, and this does relate to your work. <laughs> Can you tell us those connections, the kind well, of research you do? An astrophysicist studies the universe, and um, my training has been in a type of light called the infrared. Mm -hmm. um, and basically, I'm interested in the dark universe. Ah, it's uh -huh. where parts of the universe you cannot see with visible light. Uh -huh. right. And so I've built instruments that have flown on space observatories and airborne observatories that exploit this light and <laughs> peer into the dark universe. The wow. dark universe. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. But an astrophysicist is all about trying to understand how the universe works, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. how does it evolve, the physics behind it, the chemistry, the mechanisms. Mm -hmm. um, to explain yeah. how we are here today. Right. It's amazing. It is a big, humbling task, but worthy of a Sith Lord. Well, that's yes. right. <laughs> <laughs> you fit your role so well. I love it. Yeah. Can you tell us a bit about how you explore the universe, the, the instruments that you use or create? Um, yeah. So um, we see the universe with our eyes. Mm -hmm. um, if you go out at night, you see invisible wavelengths, you see stars. Mm -hmm. If you have access to telescopes, you can see a lot more detail. You can yeah. see deeper. You can see further. Yeah. In the infrared, um, I've built instruments that have peered into the cocoons of stars being formed wow. that you couldn't see with your eyes and have peered into the hearts of galaxies mm -hmm. to yeah. look at black holes that are fueling so cool. the galaxies and that was enabled by looking at the universe in the infrared okay wow mm -hmm. all that th yeah. becomes possible when you're not looking in only the light we can see yeah, yeah so i mean yeah, the cool. most of the universe is is revealing itself at other wavelengths. And today okay, we live yeah. in an exciting realm with gravitational wave astronomy, mm -hmm. which is opening up a new dimension to how we understand the universe. Oh my gosh. It's exciting times to be an astrophysicist. Yeah. Ah. Yes. So cool. We have yeah. some excitement in the chat, a bunch of comments for you. Karun says, I love her. Kip Exart, this is so nerdy and I love it. <laughs> Arno MCK, that dress is awesome. Alex the Unicat, nerd. I mean that in the most affectionate way. Oh, nice. Well, and the dress is also glows in the dark, oh, which is awesome. Oh, when you shine the lights on, you turn the lights off, and then you have the constellations. Oh my gosh, it just got better. I know. <laughs> uh, Amy asks, says, first of all, awesome. And Kimberly, what first you got? What first got you interested in your line of work? Oh, um, well, I was a nerd. I'm a nerd today, but I'm a happy nerd. Yeah. And as a nerd was a child and um, I I got my first telescope mm -hmm. um, when I was about seven or eight years old I saved up my um, allowance money mm -hmm. oh, nice. and um, I uh, was recently re reminded of finding some journals I kept as a young young child where I would take my telescope out and I would plot the stars and I would uh, plot the moons of Jupiter oh my gosh. and I was very conscious of how beautiful the night sky is and um, I, we live in cities and night skies are not as dark is more but if you go mm -hmm. camping or you get away from the city lights mm -hmm. it is Beautiful. just transformative i think to realize we're on this little mm -hmm. planet mm -hmm. in such a beautiful universe and mm -hmm. all those stars mm -hmm. all harbor planets as wow. well which has yeah. been so transformative in the last decade to learn that there's more planets than stars out there yeah, that's mm -hmm. incredible yeah. wow do you want to tell us some more about observatories and telescopes where you've worked on instruments or yeah. 
So I cut my teeth on uh, um, uh, building an instrument for the Spitzer Space Telescope that was launched about a decade ago. It's just nearing the end of its mission. And that revealed the infrared universe that we had not explored, these um, very longer wavelengths. And we had learned a lot about new types of phenomena. And then I built an instrument for uh, a flying observatory, which also does infrared observatory. It's the uh, SOFIA. It's mm-hmm. the world's largest flying observatory. I'm a Fred Observatory today. Yeah, that's it's got a, a plane with a telescope a plane on it, right? It's a 747 <laughs> yes. with a Hubble-sized telescope, and it also revealed even, and I built a spectrometer for that one, and that mm-hmm. was all about understanding the chemical fingerprints as, you know, trying to understand the makeup of the universe. Oh, wow. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, the community is very excited about the most ambitious infrared s- space telescope to be launched in about a year and a half from now. Mm-hmm. Not too long. The James yeah. Webb Space Telescope. James Webb. Yes. Yeah, tell us. And uh, the James Webb is a successor to Hubble. I didn't mm-hmm. mention Hubble. Hubble is an amazing observatory right now and just transform the way we understand the universe. Mm-hmm. That has worked in the ultraviolet and visible with a little bit of infrared. But mm-hmm. it has been most sensitive and the show demonstrated the power of putting a telescope in space. Oh, yes. Um, yeah. James Webb is very different. And uh, James Webb is going to be the biggest yeah. observatory we have put in space. Wow. Um, a collecting area almost seven times larger than Hubble wow. with a sensitivity a hundred times more sensitive than Hubble. That's crazy. Oh, wow. so Hubble is already incredible with yeah. the, the yeah. images it gives us. But what's wow. going to be... What gets me excited mm-hmm. about James Webb, it's the first time we've had a telescope to look at the birth of galaxies. We have never yeah. had an observatory that can look that deep um, into the universe because of its sensitivity mm-hmm. and also exploiting the infrared to peer deeper into the universe mm-hmm. uh, that will potentially catch the birth of galaxies. The birth of yeah. galaxies. We will see. Very beginnings. Baby galaxies. Baby, Baby galaxies. <laughs> the deepest we've. Oh. Work themselves out. Mm-hmm. Um, the baby or the birth of galaxies is very unknown. One wow. of the biggest unknown questions is. You know, how do the galaxies form? Mm. And in one in particular, we now have observed over the last couple of decades that all the large, massive galaxies are fueled by a supermassive black hole. Mm -hmm. These are black holes that are thousands to millions to billions of solar masses. These are incredible beasts. Wow. We have no idea how they form. Crazy. Nor do we know whether you need a supermassive black hole to form a galaxy or whether the galaxy, as it got massive, formed Be- the supermassive oh. black hole. Wow. Yeah. We, don't we have a know. chicken and egg yeah. Yeah. dilemma. So <laughs> James Webb yeah. is going to yeah. tell us. Oh my gosh. Wow. Did black holes oh, come goodness. first? Right. Or did galaxies? galaxies. Wow. Yeah. I didn't even realize that we didn't know these things. We didn't know these things. This is exciting. So much more to learn, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think we have an animation, right? We do, of James Webb Space Telescope. Yeah, for for, those don't know about this is a um, most, going to be the largest space telescope ever launched. It's going to launch in March of 2021. You see a 18 um, segmented primary mirror that's coated in gold. The diameter is 6.5 meters, about the height of a giraffe. Oh, the wow. um the bottom part that looks silverly purple is a sunshade. The sunshade is about the size of a tennis court. This is going to be launched to an orbit around the sun a million miles from Earth. Wow. Okay. I mean, Hubble right wow. now is at 375 miles from Earth. So this is a very different way of running a space telescope. With its large aperture and its um, ability to, to look in the infrared, it's cooled. Um, this uh, gives it a lot more sensitivity mm-hmm. and um, mm-hmm. yes it's going to really reveal the dark universe and not to play up the Star Wars thing it is going to bring <laughs> galaxies far far away uh-huh. <laughs> very much closer to home oh, and yes. it's really an observatory about the first stars and the first galaxies 
Wow. Amazing. Yeah. What a good story. I know. I can't wait now. I always love when Kimberly talks. I know. I love <laughs> hearing you speak. Uh, but before we have to let you go, let's get a couple questions in here. Uh, Bala Sparkle asks, what's the coolest thing that you ever saw looking into space? Can wow. You, can you name just one? Is that oh, possible? It's, it's difficult. Um, I was very privileged to um, work on the New Horizons mission that flew oh. by Pluto. Yeah. in 2015. Yeah. I was one of the deputy project science there. And to actually see a world that had been just 10 pixels in the Hubble Space Telescope camera, very blurry, mm. and have it come into life and to full color, mm. showing glaciers, oh, wow. was the most unexpected phenomena Thanks. that no one had expected. Now, yeah. I know it's closer to home rather than the black holes and the right. exotic dark matter, dark energy that is shaping our larger universe. Mm -hmm. But the unexpected. fact that we have a lot yet to still discover mm -hmm. in our home backyard. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so that was just phenomena. I, we, yeah. No one expected that. That's amazing. Your science yeah. has taken you near and far, hasn't it? Yeah, well, <laughs> so we, we study the universe. We want to yep. understand. And plus, when we understand that there are more planets um, than stars, stars hosting lots of these exoplanets, and trying to understand our solar system in context. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have a laboratory here trying to send our own solar system, but then we have thousands and now millions of solar systems right. yet to be explored. That's right. Yeah. There's so much more to do. Exciting. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, I guess our last question for you is, how could we recreate your look for Halloween? <laughs> well, um, go to a fabric store and make a black the cloak, cloak in yeah. a sense. Mm -hmm. um, for my dress, um, I just looked for a constellation dress online. It's been great at parties, conversation <laughs> starter. Yeah, nice. For the lightsaber, I borrowed one off a of friend's teenage um, child. Uh, <laughs> that's a good source. But if you want to make one at home, mm -hmm. just take a clear plastic tube and attach it to a flashlight with some duct tape. And I've learned that if I, uh, if I uh, sanded, sanded yeah. the outer side of the, just to make it more opaque. Mm -hmm. I created some diffusion effects and I was able to scattering light effect and I got to see my lightsaber. Just nice. a tube and a duct tape and a the perfect do it yourself project for Halloween. Yeah. Right? Right? Yeah. Totally doable, I think. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for the tips and yeah. also the wonderful stories about your science. Yes. Yes. Love it. And exploring the universe. Yes. And may the force be with oh, and also uh, with you. you. With all of us. Yes. yes. Thanks for joining us. As we us learn again. about the dark universe. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Fabulous. Yeah. Well, thank you. And we will bring you back out later when it's time to vote on yeah. our favorite costumes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Kimberly. <laughs> Fabulous. I and mean, you could just listen to Kimberly all day, couldn't you? I mean, really. You really could. <laughs> yes. Yes. And just be mesmerized. And yes. Just, you know, you almost feel like you're actually sitting there. <laughs> this pair boldly goes through their workday advancing the science of flight at our flight simulator facilities. Come on out, Sumita and Emily, cosplaying as NASA's Starfleet Command. Ah. Hello! <laughs> Very nice. Oh, yeah. <laughs> hey, hey, come, come on, on up have, here. Have a seat. <laughs> You look so good. Yes. <laughs> and I love that you have these costumes. Me too. Of course. Yeah. Of course <laughs> you own Star Trek Starfleet costumes. <laughs> Perfect. So, right. do you guys want to tell us your name and what you do? Hi, I'm Sumeda, and I work at the Flight Simulation Labs as Outreach and Communications. Nice. And my name is Emily Lewis. I'm a simulation engineer contractor at uh, Sim Labs at, here at SAMS. All right. You're going to awesome. tell us lots more about yeah. that. Yes. But I know what you're wearing, yes. Star Trek uniforms, uh, but tell us why, because I know there's a connection yeah. to your work here. Uh, yes, yeah, so as a kid, I watched Star Trek uh, growing up with my dad, uh, the reruns, and I was really inspired by Lieutenant Uhura, cool. the uh, communications officer, and so my costume is uh, similar to that, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, of course, uh, Star Trek, uh, with its uh, mission to do discovery and uh, explore, is, um, you know, very similar to kind of what our mission is at, at the simulation facility to yeah. advance science for that for yeah. that reason yeah 
It makes perfect nice. sense. Yeah. And I'm wearing a Next Generation Star Trek costume. And I fell in love with Star Trek um, when Next Generation was on when I was in college. So I watched it in college. And I just found the vision of Star Trek and its positive approach to space exploration mm -hmm. and te technology really inspiring. And that's one of the main reasons that I decided to study uh, aerospace engineering and why also I'm really happy to be working on NASA here. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And one other connection uh, that we have between Star Trek and where we work at the Simulation Laboratory uh, is that Star Trek has a holodeck, if you're familiar with it. The holodeck is kind of a really cool uh, high-tech mm -hmm. um, virtual reality simulation facility. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, we don't have a holodeck, but we are thinking <laughs> about including VR uh, sometime in the future. But we are advancing uh, aerospace technologies, and we are um, supporting the development of the next generation yeah. aircraft and spacecraft. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. Right. So yeah. tell us what sim the simulation labs means. You guys have a flight simulator. Right. Why don't you yeah. tell everybody about that one? So the flight simulator can really um, become any aircraft or spacecraft and wow. to test out new designs, do research for, uh, you know, any kind of new aircraft. And uh, maybe Emily can tell us a little bit more about the vertical motion simulator because that's where she's at. Yeah. 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 Yes. I'm, yes, the simulation laboratories has several facilities and the vertical motion simulator is what, where I work uh, most of the time. Uh, mm -hmm. We call that the VMS. And the, the vertical motion simulator, the VMS, uh, is the largest, um, uh, it's, a, it's a full motion, real-time piloted simulation facility, mm -hmm. and it has the largest uh, vertical motion space of any ground-based simulator in the world. Amazing. Yes. Cool. And so uh, it can designed to be reconfigurable and customizable, and so we can basically simulate any you know vehicle, real or not real notional, mm -hmm. uh, that you'd need to study. Right, right, study. Right. So, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. so sometimes it can be a boat, or it could be a plane. It's or been it a boat, be, yes. Yeah. We yeah. actually plane. have done a boat <laughs> yeah. recently. That's yeah. so yeah. 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 Spacecraft. It can mm -hmm. be a spacecraft. Yeah. We've done um, we've done helicopters, mm -hmm. you know, jets, transports. Mm -hmm. um, we did a, a bobsled. Oh, wow! I didn't work on that <laughs> yeah. one, but you know, <laughs> that's hilarious. Yeah, they actually dropped some um, uh, fruit flies once to see how they would react. Uh, And uh, like as I said, it's the largest vertical motion simulator of any in the world. It can move uh, plus 60 feet uh, vertically and uh, 40 feet uh, in the long longitudinal axis. Yes. Um, and it, we, it offers six, we call it six degrees of, six uncoupled degrees of freedom. Okay. And I'll explain what that means uh, in a minute when the video is done. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. okay. So we have this model. Uh, of one of our our VMS cabs, mm -hmm. and just to give you a perspective, the the pilots sit inside this cab, and this might fit maybe three or four people. Mm -hmm. And inside the cab uh, would be configured to be whatever vehicle you wanted to simulate. Mm -hmm. And the VMS would sit in that uh, ten-story tower, and it sits along a, a beam that uh, is, goes along the the axis so with a forty-foot-long beam. Mm -hmm. The beam moves up and down. Uh, to get the vertical motion, and then the cab moves along the beam for the lateral motion, I see. and then it moves uh, perpendicular to the beam mm -hmm. for the longitudinal motion, and that's the three translational degrees of freedom. Mm -hmm. And then it also sits on a, um, a hydraulic uh, gimbal system hmm. to provide the rotations, and so th I'll, this is the front of the cab, so the rotational axis would be roll, and then this would be pitch, pitch. Yeah. and yaw. Okay. And when we say it's six yeah. uncoupled degrees of freedom, what we mean is that, for instance, if it has a long, a large deflection in one axis, it doesn't have, it doesn't reduce the amount of travel that it can. Sure, and we've had yeah. uh, several astronauts train at the um, simulator uh, for landing the shuttle. Mm -hmm. It's important for us to uh, live long and prosper. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> and so uh, building a plane in simulation is obviously a lot safer and it's uh, more cost effective and so they can test out the new ideas, test out new procedures, see how we want to do this before actually flying in real life. Yeah, yeah. awesome. And then you've had astronauts training in that. Uh, yeah, every oh, cool. single uh, shuttle um, pilot trained mm -hmm. at the vertical motion simulator for landing. Yes, fantastic. What a claim yeah. to fame. And the, and the shuttle pilots who flew at the simulator and then actually flew in space and came back said that the simulator really represented what they felt accurately. So oh, wow. That's really, good. That's really yeah. impressive yeah. for yeah. a facility on the ground yeah. <laughs> that has yes. to make, make it up, right? Right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. Well, we have some comments and questions. We do. Yes. We have <laughs> Amy here uh, says, my question is, how are you so cool? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you're talking about Sumida. <laughs> well, it was specifically saying Sumida and Impact. Yeah. Oh, that's very kind. <laughs> that's right. Well, NASA's cool. I mean, yeah. working here is so awesome. It's and uh, with the Artemis mission coming up, uh, sending the first woman and next man to yeah. walk on the surface of the moon, that is super exciting, super cool, it's happening really in 2024. Yeah, yeah, super inspiring. Yeah. I think that leads us into a question, too, from, from the chat. Uh, RG. RJ, the noob, uh, did they test any landing simulations for any lunar landers? Uh, yes, that's a great question. Glad uh, glad you asked that because uh, we've had uh, several lunar lander studies done, um, and uh, what they learned is that uh, landing the moon is a uh, very um, difficult uh, from a control point of view oh, wow. and so motion-based simulation is critical for um, analyzing and testing and making sure that the next generation lunar lander will um, be uh, be uh, really great for the Artemis astronauts. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's think, amazing that you can simulate that as well. I know, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think we have a video of this as well of the lunar lander simulation. Oh, great. Oh, fabulous. You yeah. brought one. Excellent. I want to see that. The lunar lander sim. Yes, this is the lunar lander simulation cab, the interior of it, so you can see the um, the displays there, and there's me. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like the moon out there. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, so so we have uh, the moon simulated uh, mm -hmm. there for the landing, uh, and you can see the bird's eye view over here, and so the researchers actually get to have um, many different points of view at this uh, research facility, so they can really test um, and see from all angles, uh, see how they might want to make improvements, mm -hmm. and, and, and make those changes in the future. Awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. So great. Yeah. All right. 2024. Well, yeah, 2024. <laughs> we got yeah, the countdown so here, right? <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to have to keep moving and, and have our next contenders come on. But how can we recreate your look? Do you guys have yeah. advice? Uh, well, <laughs> what's uh, really uh, nice about the original Star Trek series is the costumes are pretty simple. You can get a uh, boldly colored shirt, maybe uh, red or blue, add some ribbon to the cuffs, yeah. mm -hmm. um, maybe add a black shirt underneath that peeks out so you can simulate having the trim. <laughs> you simulate everything. <laughs> simulate yeah. having, yeah. yeah exactly. And then, uh, you know, maybe add black boots, uh, black pants. Uh, of course, you want to have a, a Star Trek pin or you can 3D print uh, your own communicator if you <laughs> yeah, like yeah, uh, yeah. and then you'll have your yeah. Starfleet uniform yeah. excellent nice that's good advice yeah all right well thank you yes. thank you for joining us. us it's been fascinating <laughs> and we will can I say yeah. one more Star Trek thing oh, without a simulation I just wanted to say that if you want to uh, bold to go where no one has gone before yeah. and do it safely then you need to include simulation in your design process absolutely yes. Yes. absolutely yes. Yes. yeah very true Thank you. Thank you. This has been really cool, and we'll see you in a little bit. Yes. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks for coming. Thanks. All right. I love the variety of costumes and yeah. Yeah. fields of study and techniques mm -hmm. these guys use. Also, just like the con like clear connections to like pop culture stuff, like you know Star yeah. Wars, Star Trek. It's just yeah. like so easy to it's really <laughs> connect. True. Yeah. I don't think these are that much of a stretch. No, not at all. Yeah. Astrophysicist. I mean, who hasn't <laughs> met one of those? <laughs> okay, right. so should we go to? Yeah, you want to bring on the next one? Okay. Yes. So we have an intro as well. So she is the daughter of Zeus and twin sister of Apollo. Now this Greek goddess shares the name of our program that will return humans to the moon. Come on out, Daisy, cosplaying as Artemis. <laughs> Let's see this. Well, hello. Hi, Daisy. <laughs> Lovely ensemble you have on. Oh, oh nice. Let me, let me get a holder for oh, your moon. What a coincidence that you have on. Oh, yes. <laughs> Keep that handy. <laughs> Great, thank you. Come on right up here. Yeah. Scooch forward. 
Yeah, it's hard to tuck yeah. in these chairs. Some nice moon you got there. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. Let me get out of the way here. Why don't you introduce yourself All and right. tell everybody what you do here? Yeah, so my name is Daisy Stock, and I'm an intern in the exobiology branch, um, and we're concerned with origin of life chemistry. Yeah. So cool. <laughs> Well, tell us about your yeah. outfit. I'm dressed, as you guys gave me an awesome preamble to, as mm -hmm. Artemis, who is the <laughs> goddess of the moon, mm -hmm. and the twin sister of Apollo, as well as the namesake for NASA's ne next program that will take us to the moon. Yep, 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 exactly. The yeah. Artemis program, yeah. sending the next man and the first woman by 2024. Yeah, it's such an exciting mm -hmm. time to be getting involved here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Good time for you to yeah, continue the, the uh -huh. internship. And yeah, just waltz right in. And happen to end up involved. in NASA. Yeah. <laughs> Good timing. Good yeah. timing. <laughs> Why don't you. we talk about your research here? Yeah. What are you working on? Yeah, so right now I'm studying meteorites. We study um, cool. extraterrestrial samples that have fallen to Earth. Um, and we yeah. look for organic known compounds that we can look at and kind of get a sense for what was going on in the universe about, or our solar system at least about 4.6 billion years ago. Wow. Yeah. Is that when the earth was coming together yeah it's like planetary creation was kind of <laughs> ah, making the solar system I'm happen and remember. some of those chunks kind of got like stuck floating around in space mm -hmm. in our in orbit in our solar system and sometimes yeah. one will land on earth for us to study outstanding yeah. Huh. Yeah. Oh, we, I think we have a photo. Did you bring a photo of yourself? I did. In the lab? Yeah, I brought a photo of myself with the Murchison meteorite. Oh wow! Yeah, so that's cool. a sample that we have. We don't get a lot of the meteorite at any one time because it's very precious and very mm -hmm. rare. Oh yeah. Um, this particular meteorite came crashing through the roof of someone's barn in yeah. Australia into a wow. pile of hay. Um, <laughs> what a yeah. chance, right? <laughs> but it was good because we were able to get to it very quickly and mm -hmm. preserve it. Wow. Um, so it's not very contaminated. It's oh, really cool. good for study. Wow. Mm -hmm. And was that? dust from it? Was that it ground up in there? Yeah, yeah. The so um, it was a bigger meteorite. Mm -hmm. uh, it fragmented before it hit Earth, and um, that is a little fragment of the fragment that fell okay, in the haystack. Okay. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. so we have just little bits of it that we're able to perform tests on with our instruments uh -huh. and get a sense of what it's made of. Okay. Wow. Yeah. What's the big question you're trying to answer with your work? So we're trying to answer mm -hmm. the origin of life. Um, <laughs> yeah. When did it all begin? Yeah, when did it all begin? So we're looking for different compounds that cool. could have brought the building blocks to Earth to start of like kickstart life. Okay, right. Yeah. Yeah. Do you plan to figure that out by the end of your internship? Yeah, I've got another eight weeks, so I think I can get it done. Yeah, yeah. Sort that yeah. out. <laughs> got it covered. Yeah. I have full faith in you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Amy in the chat looks shocked and says, very cool. <laughs> it is Thank you, very Amy. cool. Yeah. Yeah, we have a lot of fun. So yeah. you told us a funny story the other day that you happen yeah. to know what meteorites smell like. Yeah, yeah. I, I what do. What is that about again? So like? my first day in my internship, I showed up and I was filled with nerves and I was really mm -hmm. excited and just like, just so pumped to be here and I meet my mentor for the first time and he takes out the sample and says you know this is like the most precious thing that we have in this lab like it's so expensive we have so many tests to run on it and so many questions about it mm -hmm. he takes off the cap and puts it under my nose and says what does it smell like huh. and I was like is okay is this the science for okay yeah let's do it and it smelled like soil like oh, rich wow. soil after it rains oh really yeah uh -huh. so that's interesting. I got to learn that space smells like dirt. Space yeah. smells like dirt. <laughs> Another fun fact. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of those today. Yeah. Uh, RJ the Noob has a question for you. Uh, what elements in the meteorites have you found that are building blocks for life? Um, so previously people have been looking at amino acids in the meteorites, and we're looking at a group of compounds called carboxylic acids. Mm -hmm. um, so how, yeah, how if you know anything about organic chemistry. Are they related to amino acids? They are, yes. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so, so some kind of like building block of the building block. Building block of the building block. That's okay. a good way to put it. Okay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, and a related question, Yagub2, what kinds of tests do you do on the meteors to see where they come from? Um, so right now we're doing ion chromatography and gas chromatography mass spectrometry. Mm -hmm. So basically we take the meteorites and we make them into a little solution and uh, get them all prepared and inject them into these machines that are able to tell us the retention times of the different compounds within the sample. And then we're able to run what we expect to find it to compare that to, oh. to kind of get a sense of like, if it really is what we think it is and how much is in there and questions like that. Wow. Yeah. That's very cool. cool. Thank you. Yeah. This, is, this is really great for an internship. You're doing yeah, some I'm serious work. Very pleased. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Um, do you have any tips for anybody or could, could you tell us a little bit about how you applied and got in? Yeah. So uh, like Lindley, I went to intern.nasa.gov where undergraduates, graduates and high schoolers, I believe too, can um, yeah. yep. 
can all apply for a NASA internship and you just get to go on and kind of like look for what projects interest you. My mm. advice would be to not like pigeonhole yourself into mm -hmm. one special like focus. Uh, this is the first formal training I've had in organic chemistry mm -hmm. and I think the only reason I'm here is just because I put myself out there. So oh, I'd yeah. say like, definitely like jump for things that you want to do or you're interested in because mm -hmm. the scientists here they're interested in educating the future of science. So oh, that's good advice. Fact. Great. Yeah. Awesome yeah, story yeah. and awesome research you're Thank doing you. here. Thank yeah, you. Very excited. Very cool. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, before you go, can you give some tips on recreating your look? So my look, uh, starting with the crown, I made mm -hmm. it out of a Christmas decoration that I sacrificed. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> mm, Sometimes got to do that yeah. for Halloween. Yeah, you, gotta. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you can go to Goodwill to find, uh, they have a lot of things like this, like capes during the uh, Halloween season. Mm -hmm. um, I made this out of a sheet. It's like a Your little tunic there. Tunic. Yeah. yeah, and I, I, I don't know if you could have seen, but I decided to give our modern Artemis uh, hiking pants because I think she deserves to be able to move around. <laughs> I think so. Yeah. Right. Yes. Right. Yes. Goddess of the hunt. Yeah. She needs to be able to run. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And for the moon, uh, which you're the goddess of when you're Artemis, That's right. um, you can make this out of tinfoil, paper mache, and a balloon, you know, yeah. paint. Yeah. Or yeah. 3D printed, if that's something you can do. Yeah. All kinds of ways, really. <laughs> yeah. 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 Just get creative. Uh -huh. All right, sweet. Thank you yeah, for joining us today. Thank you so much today. for having me. All right, yeah. we'll see you, see you in a soon. little bit. <laughs> All right. Another mm -hmm. cool one. I'm always amazed right. by our interns. Isn't it cool the meteorite came and just like landed in someone's barn? I know. <laughs> I know. How ridiculous. <laughs> and then they wake up the next morning and you're like, oh, didn't you're, expect that to be there. I know. You're a farmer. You have yeah. no, no reason to expect NASA to come knocking, right. but you've got a meteor <laughs> in your barn. <laughs> All yeah. right. Well, let's move on, you guys, mm -hmm. to our last contenders. Last, but certainly not least, this remarkable duo just made history by venturing outside together in the vacuum of space. Come on out, Lauren and Nicole, cosplaying as the first all-woman spacewalk. Hi. Yay. <laughs> yeah. Hello. Oh, my gosh. What? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I had no idea you were going to be fully so equipped. cool, you guys. <laughs> Come right on <laughs> up here. My gosh. Wow. I'm so impressed. Yes. Thank you. I am too. I'm curious how we're going to recreate that, but we will come <laughs> yeah. to that later. <laughs> Don't ruin it. <laughs> Don't ruin it. <laughs> okay, so tell us your names and tell us what you do here at Ames. Yeah, so my name is Nicole Carter, and this is... I'm Lauren Abbott. I'm a material scientist. And mm -hmm. I am a ceramic engineer, material engineer. Wow. Awesome. Yeah. We're both part of the material, thermal protection materials branch system. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, as you mentioned, so we're here to celebrate the first all-woman spacewalk. Yeah, yeah, which yeah. we're excited about. about. Yeah, yeah, so astronauts Christina Cook and Jessica Mir just completed this last week, uh, the first mm -hmm. time that we've had a spacewalk completed by just women. Yeah. And you know, we were so pumped about it that we wanted to dress up to celebrate. Awesome! Yeah. This is the perfect opportunity for that. It know? is. Yeah. So. I mean, with Halloween <laughs> right around the corner. It works out. Right. Yeah, that worked well. Yeah. We have a photo of these two astronauts. Yeah, Let's take a look. Show everybody. Oh yeah. yeah! Look at that. How That's cool us. Is that? <laughs> there you are. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I believe they live streamed the spacewalk on Twitch, right? So yeah, like, I don't know if yeah. it was on pretty Twitch, early. Really? That's awesome. Yeah, it was yeah. really early in the morning, but I caught the end of it. Nice, yeah. nice. Yeah, I yeah. think you can go back and see it if you missed it. Mm -hmm. So like seven hours, I think. Oh yeah, 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 that's right, that's right. Yeah, it's very demanding. A lot of it is, isn't it? Tedious mm -hmm. work in, right. in the vacuum of space. Exhausting. Right. Yeah. yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> so cool. All right. Well, tell us how that relates to the work you do. Mm -hmm. I don't yeah. think you're astronauts. Unfortunately, <laughs> as much as we would really maybe it would be awesome day. to yeah, be astronauts one cool. day, but uh, no. So we actually work on materials that help keep astronauts safe. Oh yeah. So Nicole mentioned we okay. work on thermal protection materials, mm -hmm. and those are materials that go into heat shields that. Uh, protect the spacecraft when coming back into atmosphere on uh -huh. Earth, so they keep the astronauts safe when they re-enter Earth's atmosphere. All right. Yeah, it gets up to sense. pretty high temperatures, mm -hmm. like you know, it could be up I to think 25. We even have a model. So here is <laughs> that. Here's the like the uh, spacecraft coming back into Earth, and the heat shield would be right on the front of that spacecraft. So yeah. as you're going through different atmospheres, you get a lot of heat coming through, um, pushing up against that. Uh, spacecraft, so, right. and so the temperature, the type of materials that we use are able to either push that heat away or just insulate it, just like kind of stuff that goes in your walls at home. Mm -hmm. It's just uh, an insulation type of material. Oh yeah, to um, keep things cool, to keep the astronauts from yeah. not burning yeah, up in there. Really yeah, safe, yeah. keep the structure intact, mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. same mm -hmm. idea, just really high tech 
insulation. Yes, kind of. yes. <laughs> yeah, it's not a typical uh, uh, type of environment that we happen to see on Earth very often. No. It's yeah. kind of a space specialty, right? Yeah, yeah. And right. we yeah. actually have a couple, yeah, have a couple samples of the oh. materials that are get used. Oh, awesome. Cool. We have some gloves if you wanted to... Uh, if you have hold to on hold to them, but oh, oh, can I? I? <laughs> you may want to take a glove just because they have a little bit of particulates that come off. <laughs> no other designated carbon ablator. An ablator is something that when it heats up, it creates a chemical reaction that actually throws off heat Ooh. away from the spacecraft. So you can see it's really light, it right? Is. So obviously yeah. when we're sending stuff to space, we want to keep it nice and light because every every pound mm -hmm. matters. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if we can keep the heat shield light, it gives us more more space to put other things and more weight that we can you know, yeah. doing science experiments and that kind of stuff. Yeah. So that yellow oh, is the phenolic resin that we use, and yeah. then the car the black that you see in there is that carbon. Yeah, um, so, so one thing we do as material scientists is we try to understand the microstructure of the material. So we have here, this wow. is a, a 3D printed microstructure of oh. the carbon fibers mm -hmm. that wow. are in PICA. And obviously this isn't a scale. <laughs> right, 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 right. We right, made right, it big right. so you can actually see it. I don't yeah. know if we can get a close-up, but you can take a look at that. Hold yeah, it. If you oh, hold yeah. it here, <laughs> hold actually. It here. So if we can get a close-up of that, you can see all the carbon fibers that are uh, making up the substrate of that. And so these carbon fibers are on the scale of microns, so it's kind of like the thickness of your hair. Oh, wow. Okay. So that would be a good comparison. So these are obviously much bigger. But this mm -hmm. is what the carbon fiber substrate looks like in Pika, and we in infuse that with the phenolic resin. How cool. Wow. Yeah. And why are we wearing gloves? Yeah, so it, is it to protect it, it or yeah, protect so us? You can <laughs> see a little on the table, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. a little bit of stuff comes off of it. <laughs> right, and, I got some dust on and the And you, you might yeah. see a little bit of yellow on So it's, you just don't want it to get in, into your skin. It's got little carbon pieces in it, mm, so it, okay. mm -hmm. just to keep you safe. Nice and protection. Mm -hmm. So you would use this material for a heat shield? Yeah, so this one, yeah, this one is good for, uh, it's a, because it's ablative, as Nicole mm -hmm. mentioned, it, it decomposes on reentry, so it takes away the heat from the spacecraft, mm -hmm. and it's not reusable, so it's something we would only mm -hmm. use once, one time. Yeah, yeah, okay. and then it would be thrown away. Mm -hmm. uh, but we do have re uh, reusable TPS, let me put this one away. Reusable TPS. Reusable, yeah, yeah. so that's so, the more common shuttle tile that a lot of people tend to know is mm -hmm. back in the shuttle days, and that's the whole, the white uh, silica blocks that you'll see, uh -huh. um, and they can typically be recycled multiple times. The only time that it really gets has to be um, replaced is when mm -hmm. there's any damage from asteroids or meteors Ooh. or any just uh, particles oh, okay. that are in space that are hard. So what kind of material is this? So this is really silica, light. alumina, um, and borosilicate glass. Mm -hmm. And glass has such a high melting temperature so it doesn't um, deform when in the higher re-entry atmosphere temperatures and it's actually super lightweight because air is actually a uh, poor conductor of heat. So with a lot of air in the material the heat transfer doesn't want to go through it as fast as like metal. Metal conducts heat very quickly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. yeah. Right, right. yeah. You yes. can get That's metal to heat to very quickly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So, so unlike the polymers, which like I said, decompose at high temperatures mm -hmm. and we start, you can actually see the layer start to recede over time. Mm -hmm. These won't do, do that. that. So mm -hmm. you'll be able to use them, like putting them on, like we used to have them on the spatial and we can use that, re that oh, yeah. spatial, we can reuse it several times before we need to replace them. And mm -hmm. so that helps with costs and, and it has some performance benefits as well. Yeah. And so how do you guys do this research with the materials and find out more about them? Uh, mm -hmm. So my side of it, I do a lot of the physical testing of the material so we can um, we have what's called the arc jet, which mm -hmm. is a plasma gun that shoots mm -hmm. up to 3,000 F. If not more. Ish, if not more. Yeah. I should know that, right? It's very high temperature. It's very high. It's very high. Yes. yes. Yeah. Um, oh, wow. Simulating the Simulating the, the re-entry heat. Right. Yeah, so we can stick these materials in that plasma gun. It mm -hmm. shoots it. We'll 
take a look at it afterwards, see what it, how it deforms from different temperatures. We can even increase the pressure there mm -hmm. um, and do different or even lower pressures to kind of re-simulate the low atmospheric pressure in space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, unfortunately, we can't just send stuff to space and bring it back bring it and back see how it works. Right. This is the best that we can do to try to replicate that environment on Earth. Right. Um, another thing mm -hmm. we do, so what I work on, I do computational modeling of these materials at different length scales. And the benefit of using computational tools is we can do that a little more cheaply on the computer than we could. A test, an, ar an architect test, can be very yeah. expensive. Mm -hmm. So we can do some screening of materials ahead of time in, in computer simulations and understand how that material behaves in these environments as well okay. mm -hmm. and that's much safer and cheaper than the experiments would be so um, you might start there and then choose yeah one exactly type it, we work very closely test. together so we'll yeah. simulate things and they'll test them and we'll compare and, mm -hmm. and it'll help iterate the process of testing and designing new materials mm -hmm. and testing old materials and understanding what environments they'll work in mm -hmm. yeah. yeah because yeah. you would use a different kind of material for a different kind of that's spacecraft, right, yeah. right? So they're not all going to use the same showing. kind of heat yep. shields or materials exactly yeah they they all have a special purpose so depending mm -hmm. on what the mission is we'll pick the right heat shield is because we want to minimize mass mm -hmm. so we'll pick the right heat shield that'll get the job done but not something that's too much that way we can keep the mass low and mm -hmm. then even like under tiles there are like a bunch of different types of shuttle tiles that could yeah. be more useful on certain parts of the ship um, versus some other part of tiles mm -hmm. so that I even in there I have two different tiles that one was processed slightly differently and they have different properties for it. Mm, so being able okay. to test it and know where exactly it should go on the ship mm -hmm. or what type of mission it should go into is, is okay. really key. Can I ask you some wow. questions quickly from the chat while yeah. you're yeah. back in there? Uh, Lala's 147 says, that's awesome. I love your work. Um, how third asks, are there any ceramics inside the spacecraft? Not that I deal with. Okay. I do the outside yeah, of the we spacecraft. Yeah. I mean, we have all sorts of materials in space, and you know, ceramics are really great in high temperatures. So we see those a lot in environments where we're expecting to get up to high temperatures because they yeah. won't melt at these high temperatures. And ceramics are also they're everywhere. So mm -hmm. a lot of people don't know what ceramics kind of entail, but like mm -hmm. they're in your car engine actually. Oh. So you have like the metal engine, but like the oxygen two sensor that is a ceramic material that gets used. Hmm. Um, glass gets used. It's a ceramic. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So there could be plenty of things, everyday a lot life of electronic things, it. semiconductors. Yeah. So there's definitely ceramics inside the shuttle. I mm -hmm. just don't do that. Okay. Yeah, so one other thing we do, so sometimes in high temperatures you just need to coat a material, you just add a coating on top of some kind of material that can withstand the high temperatures to protect the material underneath. Mm -hmm. So this is an example of a, of a material that has a coating on top that has oh, yeah. some kind of protective properties to it. Oh yeah. And, and so it also kind of helps um, create a tougher. So these guys, they're very lightweight, they're low yeah. density, they're kind of um, susceptible to compression. Um, mm. And so that glass coating on top of it can it also helps. help kind of dissipate any sort of uh, energy coming across that to it. That could help, wow. Compress it, right? Yeah, so I think we have a great mm -hmm. movie to show this. So, so Ooh, I yeah. said that we do simulations. One of the simulations that we do is all the way down to the atomistic scale. So ah. looking at atoms individually in these materials okay, at the nanoscale. And if, if yeah, we roll the video, the I can video of explain yeah. what's going on. Simulation. So this is, it will be a, you'll see a microstructure uh, once it comes up, a microstructure mm -hmm. of a material. And so mm -hmm. the microstructure is made up of gr what are called grains. And these are crystallites that are oriented mm -hmm. in different ways. Hmm. I think we're at the end oh. of the movie. Can we maybe Let's play start it again? That yeah. yeah. So, nice. so these are all the different grains. So the blue regions are, are very well ordered crystals. And then the gray is the boundaries between these grains. And in the simulation, so these are now 16 million atoms. It's about Whoa. 16 nanometers wow. in scale. So you can see as we pull this material apart, we can start to understand how that material fails at the atomistic scale. So oh you can gosh. see that it starts to crack between these, on these grain boundaries between the grains. And so now we can start to understand the failure mechanisms of these of materials. The materials. Yeah. Yeah. And by doing that, we can hopefully improve them and, and yeah. find out when we can use them and when we can't, and how right. we can make materials that do better. Okay, so oh, cool. That's yeah. amazing. <laughs> yeah. You're amazing. <laughs> You're like watching this video multiple times already. Ah, oh, so neat. <laughs> yeah, simulations are awesome. So. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And we do a lot of them here at NASA, don't we? NASA yeah. likes to use a lot of models. Like, like I mentioned already, right, it's really expensive to do some of the tests that we do, and it's not easy yep. to just test things in space. Right. So the more yeah. we can do things on computers, the better. And computers right. are getting so fast. We actually have a supercomputer here at, yes. at Ames. Yes. Mm -hmm. so that Let's just run very large simulations like 16 million atoms. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Impressive. Yeah, yeah, so cool. Very cool, you guys. Yeah. All right. Well, we should let you go. Yeah. And before you go, 
Do you have any advice for us on how we can recreate your costumes? <laughs> <laughs> well, for me, I'm wearing some pretty cushy pants. Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm in a cloud or a pillow. <laughs> and you can use like this boxy thing to help get your little switches, which don't work on mine, but that's okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. They have to work. Mm -hmm. I mean, they've, yeah, yeah. they give yeah. a look. Yeah. If, if you're around. really engineering, you can like hook these things up to some light bulbs. Some yeah. Or yeah. 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 I feel like you Where? could get a backpack and put a box around it. Yep. Yes. Some, like, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And you can wear yep. that yep. And, and just yeah. grab like a, well, like a bicycle helmet yeah. or like a, a motorcycle, motorcycle helmet, helmet, fish tank roll. Yeah. Those things. Absolutely. Be creative about it. Yeah. Yeah. And your lovely outfit. Fit. I mean, mine's a little easier. We've already seen a few of these types of outfits, like a nice coverall suit, something you mm -hmm. can pick up at a, right. a local hardware store or something like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Maybe paint, are, yeah, uh, print yeah. out some NASA uh, logos, maybe, you know, get the red, white, and blue in there, and slap them on, put your name on it, all that yeah. kind of stuff. Yeah. Represent yeah. NASA. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Oh, we can manage that. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent tips. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for bringing all of yes. these yeah. examples to show us. Yeah. I've yeah, heard please. about heat shields. But <laughs> you guys said bring stuff in. Like, oh, yeah, I got this stuff. We got stuff. Oh, I got stuff. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Right. We'll, we'll see awesome, you in a bit. You guys. Yes. Yeah. yeah, we'll <laughs> see you in just a moment because it's already time to yes. vote on Yay. our second segment. Yes. Do you know who you'd vote for? Have you voted, Tiffany? You get to vote, too. So I know who I want to vote for, but I'm going to keep it a secret. <laughs> yeah. You don't, you don't want to bias don't wanna in, yeah, anybody no bias, out there. No influences in the chat, you know. So. Yeah. And did you get some more ideas? I your... did, definitely. So this has been really good because I, I was not prepared for Halloween. No, I never am. <laughs> so I look so. forward to this show yeah. to give yeah. me ideas. <laughs> all right. Are you guys all ready to vote? Ooh. All right. Time to vote for your favorite cosplay costume. We're going to bring all of our guests back out, and you can vote in the chat for your favorite look. All right? So first up, will it be... Kimberly as the astrophysicist. Here she comes. <laughs> she does it so well. She was born to be an astrophysicist. Love it. Yes. Or will it be Sumeda and Emily as NASA's Starfleet Command? <laughs> Hello. Live long and prosper indeed. Yeah. <laughs> Looking good. Next is Daisy as Artemis. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> and here is one more look at Lauren and Nicole as the first all-woman spacewalk. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Oh, they're all so good. Yes. I don't know. So get your so vote get in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now is the time to vote. We are tallying your yep. votes in the chat. Get your last poses in. Right. Right. This your is votes your, are coming. This is your chance. Blow Last away. chance to win them over. <laughs> Show us your moon. Show us your model. <laughs> All right. Ready? It's coming down. It's a close. It's a close one. That's why this is tough. All right. The I've got the answer. Our winner is Darth Kimberly, the astrophysicist. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's so clever. I'm stealing that idea. Yes, that's for sure. Yeah. But you all look fabulous. Yes. Thank you for you sharing do. your research with us and your costume ideas. This has been awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Love it. Yeah. Thanks Halloween. for hanging with us. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll see you guys soon. Yeah. Thanks for joining Bye. us. <laughs> Uh, so a quick reminder that if you do end up using